Hello, everybody. My name is Jim McCoy. I'm your president. Well, maybe not your president, but if you're a member of the ECOC. Um, and welcome to the December meeting of the Essex County Ornithological Club. Uh, we are going to have a great talk tonight. Uh, Janie will tell you more, but we're going to hear about the Everglades. Um, so uh, welcome to everyone who's online. Uh, Lila will be taking questions from you. So if you have them, uh, please chip in when everyone else is, and she'll get those questions to us. Um, so does anyone have uh, any news of members or anything, any other news uh, that's relevant that they'd like to share with us or ask about? I have a question if no one has news. Um, is there anyone in our audience that knows what the status is with Andrews Point? I know uh, last we knew there was a house up for sale uh, and that would remove a large problem we were having. Uh, and uh, so we're wondering whether that house has been sold and uh, there was discussion of whether that parking area would be available to the public and I have not heard that. Has anyone here heard any updates on that situation? Anyone online? Okay, well, we'll try and get answers uh, from that. Uh, and oh, yes. <laughs> Jim McDougal is stepping up and offering to buy the property. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is our treasurer's report, Mary. This is, this is Mary Stevens, by the way. Hi, everyone. If that house is for sale for less than, say, $1,000, we can totally foot the bill. <laughs> um, kidding aside, we're actually um, doing pretty well since we switched and uh, joined uh, Venmo and, you know, the 21st century and stuff. Um, and if you have not renewed, I'll tell you again, please do. Before the end of the ECOC's year, which is August 31st, I think. After that, our dues will be going up, but as of right now, they are $12 per person, $15 per household, still a really good deal. Um, and we also have ECOC window decals so that you can show that you're, you're part of the crew, the flock, if you will, if you're out there. Um, and I had one other piece of correspondence that I got from Shiloh McDonald. Shiloh, are you here tonight? He might be online, I'm not sure. Um, he sent us a card, an ECOC Christmas card, I think, mm -hmm. that uh, shows his backyard and he just says, uh, happy, happy new year. He says this year he's seen 301 species all in Massachusetts. So, and he's got a few days left, that's pretty impressive. So, um, there is that. If you enjoy the speaker tonight, we have, uh, a small box out front for anyone who'd like to donate to the speakers fund. And I put a pen out there for anyone who would like to renew with paper. The um, renewals or membership forms are out there. So um, thank you all very much. This is gonna be a great presentation and I look forward to it myself. I'm sure you do too. Thank you, Mary. Uh, let's talk about sightings. Has anyone been birding? Yes, Robert. Wait a minute. I was out at Andrews Point um, earlier this week, and I, yeah, I did park in the that parking area and oh. walked. And it's really not bad, and nobody bothered me. But the the, bird, the avian highlight was a female king eider, uh, which was lovely. And the, there's just a whole lot of. Uh, Black scoters, a couple of hundred off of Andrews Point, but we, along with the common eiders, but the highlight was the uh, king eider female. 
Now, by the way, if you haven't been to Andrew's Point, it is a quite famous uh, seabirding destination up, up in Rockport, and it is well worth it. Uh, you can get all sorts of uh, alcids, uh, thick-billed myrrh, uh, dove keys, uh, razor bills, uh, black guillemot, uh, along with ducks like uh, eiders, including the king eider, which is quite rare, well, rare in Massachusetts. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great place for sea watching. Harlequin ducks. Oh, it's one of the best places for harlequin ducks. Thank you, Dana. Any other sightings that people want to report? Um, there's been a continuing loon on in Beverly uh, off Independence Park. Very nice. Hello. A couple of weeks ago at the Wheel of Brader in Saugus, we saw a yellow billed cuckoo. Ah, very nice. Yeah. Craig has a sighting down here. Wait a minute. No, wait, wait for the microphone, if you would, Craig. Last week, there was a um, rough legged hawk at Nelson Island. I was there today, and it was too distant to identify, but I'm pretty sure it's still there. Uh, I also had an orange crown warbler along the railroad tracks uh, off Old, Old Rowley um, Road. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, this is a pretty good year for orange crowned warbler. They can be tough to come by in the spring. Uh, they're oddly easier to find in November. Uh, well, really all fall and into the early winter. Uh, they're one of the, the more common warblers that we have this time of year, which is to say they're not very common at all, but, but at least you can have a shot at them. It was an eastern screech owl in a tree at the Spencer Pierce Little Farm in near Ooh, Plum Island. Nice. Uh, just sitting in, in this little hole in, in the tree. On, on the little entrance driveway? Mm -hmm. yep. Ah, on, yep. on the So on the right side as you're coming into the... On the right side as you're coming in, but yeah. you see it coming out. So it's Spencer Pierce Little uh, Farm, which is... Be, in uh, Newbury. Behind, it's, it's off of 1A and it's behind the uh, uh, Parker River uh, headquarters, um, but you access it from the 1A side and they've got it like a petting zoo and, and uh, it, it's kind of a cool place. Great place for horned larks and Lapland lung spurs and things like that, but also apparently a screech owl. Very nice. Anything else? I've got one um, from online. Um, uh, a bald eagle sitting at the Salem commuter rail station. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's that'll get your morning started. That's a, a good way to start. All right. Um, so uh, poor Dawn has been working very hard on the a book of the month club and she's read all the books. Uh, we what we're going to do is we're going to change that over. If you have uh, a book that just knocks your socks off about birds and you just want to let the club know about it by all means volunteer it i'm not asking anyone to do that right now but but uh, uh so well we're we're going to uh instead of uh trying to come up with something every month we'll do it organically and if members have something we'll we'll uh we'll share it all right well i let me introduce our the person who runs our speaker series our vice president janie winchell who is also the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of the Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center at the Peabody Essex, here at the Peabody Essex. And she will introduce uh, our speaker. Thank you, Janie. It's great to see all of you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming, um, both in person and virtually. This is a special one of our special co-hosted events. Tonight, the Everglades, before and after with Tom Tining. I'd like to take a moment first to thank the Lowell Institute for their vital support of this program. And as Jim mentioned, I'm Janie Winchell, the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of the Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center here at PAM and Vice President of ECOC. And I am so pleased to be introducing tonight's guest speaker. So Tom Tining is a highly respected naturalist and field biologist based in Western Mass, which is still in this state. 
he was telling me that the further you go west, the more you have to let people know that there's still more beyond that. There's west beyond Amherst. So he earned his bachelor's of science in wildlife biology and a master's in organismic and evolutionary biology, both from University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where he focused on the biology and conservation of the timber rattlesnake. He was a field biologist and master naturalist for Mass Audubon for 24 years before joining the Berkshire Community College, where he has been a professor of environmental science since 1999. He also served for a number of years as an adjunct professor in the environmental studies program at Antioch, New England, where he taught ornithology, field entomology, and both amphibian and reptile biology as part of their master's program. He also wrote a weekly nature column for Springfield Union News for 25 years. Although Professor Tining is an avid consumer of all things natural history, his main research interests are amphibians and reptiles. He served as managing editor of the science journal Herpetological Review for 15 years, and he's the author of A Guide to Amphibians and Reptiles, which is part of the uh, Stokes Nature series. Throughout the year, he conducts various short and long-term field research projects on vernal pools rare salamanders, Berkshire butterfly populations, and endangered snake species in Western Mass. He was instrumental also in jumpstarting the installation of salamander tunnels in Amherst and uh, the Mass Herpetological Atlas through Mass Audubon. So lots of different interesting projects that Tom is involved in, but tonight he's taking us with him to explore the changing Everglades, a place that he has been to many times and most recently just this last March. And uh, just that reminder of it being the largest subtropical wilderness in the US. And so I'm committed to getting back down there um, myself. And I hope you will all join me in giving Tom a very warm welcome from his journey from the Western part of the state. Thank you, Janie. I recognize some of you folks in here, kind of frightening. When I came in here first, there were all people, there were at least 100 people here in, in the tuxedos and long dresses, and I thought, what kind of a bird club is this that <laughs> I have to dress like this? I got really frightened. That's not really true. Uh, but anyway, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be out here. It's kind of embarrassing that even though there's a western part of the state, we do remember there's an eastern part, so I'm spending the weekend here. I may get to Andrew's Point uh, this weekend and uh, Plum Island, which I haven't been to in several years. So I do bring students out there as well. When I was um, a former child, I kind of got fascinated as a teenager uh, with the natural world. In fifth grade, uh, when teachers asked, as you most of you remember, they actually asked you what you're going to do when you grow up. And uh, so I said, a herpetologist. And they said, what the hell is that? And I said, well, it's you know somebody who follows around frogs and turtles and things. And they said, oh, that's really nice. And for some reason, uh, I didn't lose that. And part of that not loss was to get out in the field. I grew up in Western Massachusetts in the Connecticut Valley and my big move to the Berkshires, my big move west. Uh, it turns out that in your backyards, you already know this, there is an incredible amount of stuff, but there's other places as well. And as this teenager, as I was growing up, uh, uh, friends of mine, neighbors, had a, a guy who was about my age who didn't go to school, but was kind of fascinated by nature, particularly interested in photography. And he, uh, he and I got to be good friends. And finally, when we turned 18 and got our driver's license, he said, well, let's do what we've been talking about for three years, and that is go to the Everglades. Some of you may remember that big road, 95, wasn't there all in those days. We drove nonstop in his Plymouth Duster uh, from uh, what, Massachusetts all the way down through some of the weirdest back roads in the Carolinas and Georgia. When we got to the state boundary, it said, welcome to Florida. I said, oh my God, we're here. <laughs> and then it was another seven hours before we actually got to 
Everglades National Park. It was a, really my first trip anywhere, and I was flabbergasted. Uh, we could only spend a few days, really three and a half to four, four days. And so all I'm going to do is tell you some of the stories about what's here. And mm, got it. Uh, let me see if I can. Don't go away, Janie. Oh, that's all I have to do. So the, uh, the big deal about national parks is, of course, you've all been to them. I should ask here first, how many people have been to Everglades National Park? Should be most of you here. If you haven't, uh, pay your dues doubly this year uh, because it is incredibly important to understand this stuff. And so these first national parks were really part of a fascinating interaction. You've all heard the story, I'm sure, between uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir uh, and lots of other things. And it really is an important thing. Here's all the national parks in the country. Most of you have probably been to more of them than I've been to, but uh, there's always more to go and visit. And we were talking at dinner about, about Alaska and I'll get down there, I promise. I'll start planning tomorrow. So um, how many people go to these things and who visits national parks? It's kind of a fascinating thing. And, Let's compare it to all this other stuff. I mean, you guys are sort of in this area, so you know all these sporting stuff that we don't know much about out there. Uh, how many people do this? 17 million people go to NBA games. 17 go to NFL games. How about the hockey league? 21 more people do hockey? I never would have thought of it. How about baseball? Oh, please, please, please. Thank God. <laughs> How about NASCAR? <laughs> Whew, thank God. <laughs> Let's keep going. Visiting zoos or aquariums, 175 million people a year. And how about national parks? Almost 300 million people a year visit national parks. And many of us know them as places to, it's great to visit. They're really neat. You got to stay on the road. You can't go off too far off the road, off the uh, highways and the trails. But that is really a spectacular bit of information. More people by far than all the other things that you hear about in constant news about the sports and who's doing what. We're hardly hearing enough in in uh, general news about the parks where most people go, and that should be. Um, sort of an effort in our minds to get this word out more and more. So for those who know Everglades, you know that it is uh, only in South Florida. In fact, it's the only place like this on earth. There is no other Everglades ecosystem on the planet. There are freshwater marshes, there are saltwater marshes, but there is nothing on the planet like this. And it's been uh, highlighted as a world uh, natural heritage site, no surprise. You've all heard about that big round blue spot uh, on the left side, Lake Okeechobee, uh, as one of the sources of the Everglades water. Uh, but the Kissimmee River and others that go into Lake Okeechobee are all part of it. You've all known and heard, I'm sure, about some of the issues going on with there. But I have to say, the big deal about Everglades, unlike all the other national parks, is that it is at the bottom of the watershed. The all other parks own the mountains, the beautiful scenery, the glaciers, the snow melt. That's the top of the watershed. The Everglades is the bottom of the land and it gets everything that comes down there. You can see by the arrows on the right side here, the general flow historically of all the water that came out of Okeechobee and some of the other areas. You'll see the big cypress um, forest. That line going uh, left and right down uh, two thirds of the way is the Tamiami Trail and uh, Tampa to Miami, hence the name Tamiami Trail. And uh, it's a dam, and it has basically stopped water from going any further. The National Park is just below the Tamiami Trail. For those who uh, know it, you know that well. Uh, up until uh, when I first got there, we drove on the Tamiami Trail one day and uh, counted four culverts, four holes in the road that allowed all the water in there. And that was it. Everglades National Park is about the size of the state of Massachusetts. It is massive. And there's only two roads in it. Imagine that. I came up 128 today. <laughs> How do you guys do this? 
two roads. One is a 38-mile road that goes from the entrance near Homestead, Florida, down to what used to be a pretty big town um, called Flamingo, right on the edge of Florida Bay. The other one is a road that was built by oil companies to get oil out of the Everglades, and that is the Shark Valley area. It's now part of the park. So there's only two roads. Imagine that in a place almost the size of Massachusetts. In conservation word, you've all known this story. It is, in fact, uh, here in the Everglades that uh, Massachusetts Audubon, that uh, many other groups really got their foothold by people who were discovering that um, the millinery trade that was based on bird feathers was decimating bird populations. And it was several people in Florida who started making uh, big stinks about this. And then it was the two women who started Massachusetts Audubon Society uh, up on the hill who said, uh, in fact, started the first conservation boycott that I know of on the planet. And that was they convinced all the upper class women to sign a pledge that they would not buy any more uh, clothing that had bird feathers in it. And uh, you all heard about the ornithologist at the American Museum who walked around uh, Central Park one afternoon and counted something like 64 species of birds, every one of them on hats, including entire terns, entire swallows, not just the feathers. And uh, a woman from uh, the Berkshires uh, who died some years ago, she, was, she died at 90, her grandmother gave her a, one of these plumes. It was, uh, it was a uh, spectacular um, thing that sort of dripped off the back of her hat. And I still have that as a kind of a strange thing. Uh, Guy Bradley was a young man who lived in uh, Flamingo. And uh, once the state started to say, well, let's try and protect these birds. And in fact, Florida uh, decided that they would not allow uh, plume hunting anymore. Flamingo was actually one of the main sources of these plumes because as you'll see, and most of you already know, the Florida Bay is loaded with these mangrove islands. And the birds, especially the herons and egrets, spoonbills, would fly out there and have their nests on these islands because you can't get a raccoon out there and it's hard for the alligators to climb those trees. So they were really good nesting sites. Guy Bradley, uh, I think he was in his 20s, um, bought, uh, um, all right, 33, uh, was hired as a warden to protect those birds. And one day he heard some shots uh, out on the islands. He uh, paddled out uh, there and his body floated up on shore at Cape Sable uh, three days later. Everybody in town knew who did it. And they went and burnt his house down and they drove him back to um, Key West and he was never heard from again. And it was the first real obvious sort of tragedy in the conservation of birds and eventually other animals as well. So Guy Bradley has a little plaque down there. Of course, we were teenage kids, first time in a long distance drive going down there. And yes, you can see you know, these things commonly around here, but oh my God, the first stop we had uh, in the park, there was great blue herons 10 feet away. How is this possible, we thought? That doesn't happen up here. Here, of course, are the plumes and a lot of these birds that are nesting out there. Uh, once the plume hunting got to its peak, instead of just shooting the birds, of course, they'd shoot the adults and pull out the eight or 10 aigrettes, hence the name egrets, the aigrettes, those plume feathers. Uh, of course, the babies would starve to death. But eventually they started using dynamite and they would blast an entire uh, key and uh, then just pick up all the, pull the feathers out of all these things. Uh, it's not luckily like that anymore. So here's the park boundaries, the bottom of this watershed, that one road going through that reddish one there, uh, the, uh, goes from Homestead down to Flamingo. And uh, we didn't know anything about this. We only had three and a half days. So we hopped in the car, we drove that 38 mile road in fact, we got to be good friends even that first year with some of the naturalists who told us a lot of things, brought us out to places. And one of them did a nighttime talk at the edge of the, uh, of the amphitheater there at the edge of Florida Bay. And he had a talk called 38 Miles of Nothing. He said, most visitors, when they came into the park, they drive that road, which is a 50 mile speed limit, by the way, which is sort of like 128. Hmm. 50. <laughs> and, uh, 
people would drive all the way and say, there's nothing out here. And they'd come to the visitor center at Flamingo and he tried to start helping people see what to see. This is an aerial, that's the Tamiami Trail. It goes straight through uh, and divides that Everglades into a whole area. It really is dramatically different. Now, most of you know, there's really only two seasons down here. This is the subtropics in, in the United States. Uh, and that is the rainy season and the dry season. Unlike Costa Rica and your other places down south where it's a rainy season and then a really rainy season, uh, this is a dry season, which is the winter time, which is when we go. They also are subjected to spectacular weather conditions like hmm, hurricanes. And so a lot of the places up there get dramatically adjusted one way or another. And uh, a few years, oh, about every 10 years, they get a pretty good hurricane coming through, which uh, they have to adjust to. Uh, you. I'm sure for those who are interested in this, know the uh, books and the writings of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who went to Wellesley College, by the way, uh, and uh, is one of our local heroes. Um, she was 108 years old. I only saw her once. Uh, she was on her way to give a presentation and I happened to be down there and waved to her and I'm sure she remembers me. <laughs> that book, The River of Grass, is uh, just really the first time that anybody called it something other than a swamp. And she spent a fair amount of time really looking into this as she was writing for the, I think it was the Miami Herald or at least the previous, uh, the precursor to it. And she was excited about the conservation of this whole region. This was before all the farms had been put in before below Okeechobee to the Tamiami Trail. This was before um, uh, Miami even got big. In fact, Key West was bigger than Miami population-wise up until the 1930s and 40s. Uh, that was the biggest state, a uh, biggest city in the in Florida. At any rate, she wrote this book as valuable and as important as somebody else you remember who wrote a little book about DDT. Who was that? Rachel Carson, very good. You should all be announcing this left and right. It's sort of like a class that I'm doing, sorry. You're supposed to be awake still. So anyway, uh, sh this is as important and valuable and accurate a book ever written. And I've got a copy of it out there for you to take a peek at. But right outside the park, right outside the park is the winter vegetables, some of them, much of which you guys eat. The amount of water that is taken out there uh, for these vegetables is tremendous. And water quality has all, even when I first went down there back in 1970, it was 1970s uh, is when we first did our first trip. <clears throat> if there's enough water, then you have these giant areas. These are called sawgrass prairies, as you all know. This is mostly, it's not grass at all, there's sedges and a lot of other things in there too. But these massive uh, landscapes, hundreds and thousands of acres of this expanse of sawgrass. There's also the very edge of the distribution of cypress trees. And these dwarf cypress trees are there. Uh, if you look at the elevations here, there's no nosebleed issues here in, in the Florida. You can, we've brought bicycles down some years. And I've been now to the park probably 30 or 40, maybe 50 times by now, I can't even remember. But on the drive down, we used to keep track of every hawk that was on the tree, the birds we saw, the road kills. We have all that stuff listed down something that should be in this museum because no it should <laughs> at any rate spectacular low landscape and that is the amazing thing about south florida there is no hills the biggest mountains in south florida are the uh, trash dumps are the uh, uh, the landfills uh, but the rest of it is all this kind of height and of course those cypress zones uh, will have lots of things in there you can't have the great birds that everybody wants to see the ibises and all the rest of them without having lots of invertebrates and then an awful lot of other stuff that is keeping these wetlands uh, fresh and rich if you look out into these sawgrass prairies you'll see these little sort of uh, they're called tree islands uh, these domes uh, either made of cypress or hardwood hammocks depending on uh, the depth of the water there. And that gives us a little hint of the, really much of South Florida has this uh, limestoney material called marl, M-A-R-L. And that is uh, somewhat uh, er uh, very easy to erode in certain parts of the uh, state. In other parts, it's above the water line, so it actually persists. And in the dry season, that water drops down and makes these little uh, 
holes that the incredible small fishes that feed everything that we want to see uh, down there. So uh, in the dry season, you can see more things. Of course, there's spectacular uh, 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 trees down there. The state tree of Florida, uh, the sable palm uh, is there and uh, lots of other things. There are hardwood forests also, which seems a little odd, excuse me, pinewood forest, it seems a little odd. And that's because there is a little ridge of land that's two and a half feet to three and a half feet above the three foot level. So there might be a four and a half foot elevation. And because of that, an incredible pine forest exists. 99.9% .9 of it is completely gone because that's what all the cities on the East Coast are built on those uh, pine ridges, and uh, those are all gone. The only places left are a couple of little, cute little spots in, in uh, city parks, but the vast majority are here in the, uh, in the Everglades. When I went to the Everglades, all I remember seeing was TV shows about alligators and all that stuff. I had no clue there was pine trees that had an awful lot of really neat things in them. Uh, the Saul Palmetto, which is the basic uh, understory here. These are very fire adapted uh, habitats, uh, uh, ecological communities, and uh, the Park Service does burn them on occasion, but lightning does it also for them. So these are pretty unique places uh, if you want to see some of the neat southern birds, including uh, red cockaded woodpeckers get down this far, which is kind of amazing. Way down at the bottom, this is actually uh, uh, another landscape that is salt tolerant. Uh, these are these prairies that are right next to the bays. And there is a fantastic pile of plants called pickleweed and other things that are very succulent because they need to hold in fresh water while a salt spray gets in there. But this is the place to see the first or second smallest butterfly in North America, uh, the little pygmy blue and they are smaller than your thumbnail and fairly common in some of the places down there. If you walk out to some of those islands, you may remember some of these are actually holes in the ground where the cypress trees can grow. And these cypress trees need a lot of water. They have all those um, uh, prop roots that, not the prop roots, but the, uh, uh, the big heavy um, uh, prop roots coming up that hold them in place. They need a lot of water. And so if you stand back from these domes, uh, they're called that because they are arched and the tallest uh, of the cypress trees are in the center in the deepest water and the shorter ones are getting less water so this dome is out there and these can be really spectacular places so i've taken we my buddy and i that first week we walked out there and because the naturalist said go do it what could possibly go wrong so there's an alligator over here and maybe a water moccasin over there but that's what we wanted to see, and we saw them, along with all the cool birds. Uh, besides the, uh, uh, the cypress, most of you know are conifers that lose their leaves. Uh, what's the tree up here that's a conifer that loses its leaves? The larch, what's the other name? Tamarack. Tamarack, very good. And same thing as these cypress trees, they're called, some of them uh, called bald cypress because they lose their leaves. How about this tree on the right? Who knows it? Who knows it? Gumbo limbo, Gumbo limbo exactly. Uh, also called the tourist tree because that's what tourists look like about 10 days after they get to Florida. <laughs> Start peeling their skin left and right. Spectacular tropical uh, and subtropical plants which are coming into the US only in the Everglades. And that was not what we were ready for either, but we couldn't help it. And of course we did get to see alligators. Of course, we couldn't live without that. One of the greatest animals in, uh, in really the world, uh, certainly the, related to the archosaurs from the old days, and still relatively little was known about these things even then. They were thought to be, as most people did, uh, to be bad animals. And uh, they were going to hunt birds down and eat those, and they're bad for people who want to get into the water. The alligators sort of uh, are widespread. They can be found in, in the freshwater marshes, in the sloughs, and also right down where the mangroves start to grow. And the mangroves are only growing where there's some saltwater intrusion. And on this left-hand picture is where really fresh water coming down past the Tamiami Trail, if it gets into the park, is meeting salt water coming in from Florida Bay. And that is the beginning of these mangroves, which require this. Uh, there's three different 
plants named mangroves are totally unrelated to each other. Uh, these are red mangrove roots on the, on the right here that are spectacular. And if you watch them, in fact, the second time we went down, we were really prepared. We pulled all of our money, put it into a, a coffee can on the front of the car, and it was uh, $18.34. And we just drove nonstop the whole way through, and we discovered that we ran out of money three days into it and, and had, couldn't buy any food. So the naturalist said, go out to the mangroves and scrape the oysters off of these mangrove roots. We did. I had no idea how hard it was to get an oyster off of a mangrove root. We lost lots of weight that week. <laughs> and I think we ate about four oysters. And, uh, but it was eating off the wild, eating out of the Everglades, the real kind of stuff. Florida Bay, uh, a magnificent uh, piece of property that is one of the great tree islands out there that had, and still has some, but it had as many as four to 6,000 nesting pairs of herons and egrets, spoonbills, ibises. Uh, they're coming back and there's, some of these islands are doing um, pretty well with their birds, but this is, I'm standing to take this picture right on the edge of the campground at Flamingo, which of course is not a town anymore. The uh, uh, palm trees up there, in fact, the first place many of you will remember that you get into the park is uh, the Anhinga Trail. The Anhinga Trail was part of the first actually state protected part of the Everglades called Royal Palm. And that area is still one of the most attractive places to go. If you haven't been there in a while, it is still rich. The Anhinga Trail named for the birds that don't seem to nest at the Anhinga Trail anymore. They are now, um, have been outcompeted by cormorants. And that, I don't understand why, but they seem to be. Uh, the wildflowers down there, the knicker bean up there, uh, lots of uh, spectacular things, including uh, a relative of this bottom one called the moonflower. It's pure white, lives as a, as a, uh, a vine on the ground, and it only opens at night actually right at dusk, and we discovered this because one of the naturalists said, so every time I've taken students or others down there, I make you sit and look at these buds because they open this fast. <laughs> but here they go. And within 20 seconds, maybe a half a minute, they're wide open. And within about 30 seconds after that, the first sphinx moths show up and they are entirely dependent on both the sphinx moths and the moonflowers to get, uh, to get pollinated. And it is a really uh, nice thing to see. Lots of other spectacular things, coral bean, this uh, hummingbird specialty, a tropical species that's found uh, in, in the edge of the pine forest down there. And of course, the bromeliads uh, are hard to imagine, Talansia, the genus there, uh, the white water lilies, this, uh, various couple of species in the wetlands as well. These things were unique to us. And um, that is to say, uh, you, no, you see a squirrel's nest here and you see that's in the tree. Down there, you have thousands of bromeliads that are growing up there. And of course, the Spanish moss, which is not a moss, flowering plant indeed, uh, one of the great uh, southern examples of tropical conditions that we don't have anywhere else. The Anhingas, uh, when they were there abundantly, were easy to watch, uh, watch them feeding. Uh, it's kind of amazing. This one on the left is reaching over saying, I used to have an oil gland, but I don't know where it is. Uh, for some reason, uh, a few birds have a very poorly developed oil gland, including the anhingas. So when they swim underwater to get their fish, they come out soaking wet, and then they have to sit there and air their wings out uh, eventually to dry off. Uh, it's kind of uh, interesting to watch them. Their feeding is spectacular, and of course, you take a canoe trip out and getting closer to some of the back country where the, the ibises are really not hanging around people, uh, wood storks, of course, one of the great endangered species that are down there, now beginning to get a little bit more common in some places, even in suburban places. It's kind of surprising to me. This is our idea when we first went down as a, of, of wilderness and 
excitement. We were got a little tent right on the edge of Florida Bay in what used to be the town of Flamingo. And from here, we would travel up and down that 38 mile road. We would wait for uh, night because there's southern stars. You can see stars from the southern sky just down here in the very edge of Florida. Uh, these uh, red mangroves here, uh, excuse me, it's a black mangrove. Uh, all the beautiful views out there. Uh, all of those dots out there are birds. Um, when the tide is low, there's there have been historically anyway hundreds of thousands of everything from uh, uh, plovers to sandpipers to uh, skimmers uh, watching them fly back and forth. Of course, we wanted to see the really amazing birds and we would drive up uh, the road to a couple of Morassic Pond and a couple other spots where you could get feet from spoonbills and watch them doing their strange stuff. And one day we were there watching and there were other people and one of the guys said, you should have been here a half an hour ago. Wow, this is spectacular. He said, no, no, half an hour ago, there was a spoonbill back there in those mangroves and a bob came out, bobcat came out and ate it. <laughs> I would have liked to seen that, <laughs> sort of. Uh, but the stuff that people saw and kept seeing and telling us about time and time again, we didn't spend a lot of time sleeping. We would get up uh, uh, early, get to these locations, uh, even driving, driving up to the pine lands where the landscape is so, was so different from our New England places. Uh, plovers yanking out um, polychaetes from the mud flats out there where we would travel. First time we could see not just the one rare pelican that shows up in New England here, but dozens and hundreds of them, both brown and white pelicans getting a chance to see these birds really close. Even though they're common here now, they are easy to see down there. And it's a place where you might find yourself getting reacquainted with everything. Uh, it's always fun to watch the anhingas and other birds doing their feeding. And they're feeding, of course, on these fishes, which in the dry season get congregated in two places, those little um, uh, rocky pools, but mostly in alligator holes. And in fact, it's those alligators that dig through this stuff called paraphyton. It's this mucky stuff that's in all those sawgrass landscapes. And that paraphyton is filled with blue-green algae and um, cyanobacteria and incredible numbers of small invertebrates. And it is the basis for virtually all the food chains that feed everything. And to get that little tiny stuff to the big stuff like birds, it's the fishes that are the intermediaries. And most of these are uh, guppy relatives, the uh, fall fish and uh, mosquito fish that are incredibly abundant. And one time uh, we went down there and in this shallow mangrove area, there was a snowy egret feeding along the edge. And of course, you all know that they'd stalk them and then they would stiletto into the water. And of course, you could see the rippling of all the fish getting the hell out of there. But just off the shore was a merganser who as soon as the egret hit, it would dive under and get all this food. And as soon as the fish saw this merganser, they ran back to the shore. And the egret said, thank you very much. And they, it, we watched this cooperative feeding behavior that at that time hadn't even been dis talked about as far as behaviors of birds. And it's these fishes that are running it all. First chance to get close-ups of vultures and including black vultures, which believe it or not, in those days, they weren't up here. Uh, there were no, I had two black vultures, by the way, in Pittsfield two days ago. Uh, which was kind of neat to see. We have about 85 all winter in the Ber Southern Berkshires. At any rate, uh, if you, um, when I take people down and they want to learn how to identify the vultures, you just wait till they sit side by side and say, on the left is turkeys, on the right are the black vultures, and it's really easy. But the alligators really grabbed me. <laughs> I don't mean literally. Although one time I was down there and I brought one year a, a tape recorder because how many of you heard, have you ever heard baby alligators, little, little tiny ones? They call for their mother. Mm, 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 mm. And uh, I wanted to record that because I had no life. And so I went down there and there was a spot where the alligators, there's baby alligators. Couldn't see the mother, but I could hear the baby. So I got my, actually a big parabolic reflector in the old days. And some of you may remember tape. 
um, in the tape recorders and I'm playing it and some car went by and it ruined it, but I was so cheap. I only had one roll of tape. So I rewound it and then I had to play it to find out where it was again. And when I pushed the button to play, I could hear on my tape, I got, mm, mm, mm. and that's when the mother came out, <laughs> who I hadn't seen. I left the stuff there and my buddy and ran <laughs> as fast as I could. <laughs> These behaviors of alligators are getting more interestingly complex as people begin to learn about them. And this, although it looks like it's smiling, of course, is thermoregulating. They are losing a lot of the heat that they are just getting. If you've got a black vest on in the middle of winter, even down there, it's hot and they are getting overheated. They need to bask like many animals do, and they're doing really well. And here is a different mom with her babies. And it turns out that there is huge amount of maternal behavior in alligators and crocodiles that they do take care of their young for two to three years uh, not unlike other animals that you may uh, be aware of people had no clue about that because until the park was put in there the only use for an alligator was a sideshow by the seminoles or other people coming down from elsewhere where they would wrestle the alligators or kill them uh, and and feed on them. It's now legal. There's so many people say there's so many alligators now that they actually have a hunting season and you can buy alligator meat if you want. But I have to tell you, the alligator meat is just the tail. The rest of it is useless. <sighs> Try not to do it. These little baby alligators are there. And if you go to any of the culverts around or pools, there will be lots of little ones. They will rest on their mom. And I promise you, they will be taken care of. The small alligators in the form of lizards. Uh, how many of you ever had a pet chameleon? Somebody in here must have. Yes, don't you? They're a little shy now. Of course you did. And uh, fantastic. There's now an invasive species called the brown anolis that is out competing these things really well. Uh, the skink on the right, blue, the males have this bright blue tail uh, that are sometimes not easy to find. I haven't seen very many of them down there at all. And of course, being a herpetologist, I had to um, really look for snakes. And uh, in the first trip, 17 years old, 18, all right, I lied, I was 17. Went down there, driving the road, and there's a snake in the road. And we slam the brakes on, and I get out, and I stop traffic on this 50-mile-an-hour road. <laughs> stop! It's a rattlesnake! It's a rattlesnake! you got to see this. And I'm stopping cars in both directions, and people are looking at me like, what is wrong with this guy? And I said, no, it's really a rattlesnake. Come and see it. I was so excited. Finally, some guy walked up to me and said, did you look at the snake? I said, well, no. He said, it's not a rattlesnake. <laughs> I said, oh, it was a water moccasin, which was even cooler to me. <laughs> And they are down there as well. Nobody gets bitten by these things unless you grab them. That's how you get bitten, is you grab these things. On the left is uh, last March when I took students. Uh, we had an eight and a half foot diamondback rattlesnake, this one crawling across the road and uh, kind of fascinating. On the right is the smallest, one of the smallest rattles, in fact, the smallest east of the Mississippi River, the pygmy rattlesnake uh, down there. Uh, very, very fancy to see. Spectacularly neat turtles like the soft shells. This one is crossing the road when I had students down with me. They stopped, I sent them out to stop the traffic. That's what students are for. And it was really fantastic that people were actually looking at these animals as they were driving up and down this road and actually acting like it was pretty cool. Um, Red-shouldered hawks, which we, which actually used to be a common when the when this club was around in the 30s and 40s, uh, red-shouldered hawks were common in New England, and now they are absolutely not so common. You see them every year, but they were nothing like this. Down in Florida, you all know that one of the fantastic activities of people studying birds that have or other animals that have long geographic ranges, these uh, Florida red-shouldered hawks are completely pale compared to our northern ones. If you had them side by side, you'd say, this is a partial albino. It's, it's how light they are compared to these. And it's kind of neat to see the variations. In these first trips down there, we could see um, uh, wonderful uh, examples of this. And we met a couple of, uh, of women who were there year after year. So I would go down, we went for five or six, all right, 10 years in a row. We just kept going down there. And we got to know visitors, never mind the naturalist. And these visitors, these women, uh, 
after about six or seven years, uh, I said, so you're, this is really fantastic. They showed us where all the birds they were seeing. And, uh, and they said, but you know, we're, we're getting tired of it here. There's not many birds left. And I'm looking at a sky that always has a bird in it or dozens of them at the same time. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, you should have been here 20 years ago. And I said, all right, and I let him go. I said, boy, those, they're just nuts. This is spectacular. And when I went down this past March, I, saw, I, I felt what they felt. It just wasn't the same. It was still spectacular, and the students I happened to have with me were bonkers when they saw these things. But it really isn't uh, like it was. Populations of most of the Everglades birds are down between 60 and 90%. They're still there, but they're down really low. And part of the problems are, of course, um, the dramatic change in water. Now, the feds have planned 15 years ago to fix this, and they have actually started. The Tamiami Trail now has something like 23 holes in it, and they've actually lifted and made a, uh, an overpass uh, over some of the largest channels now. The hope is that with additional things they have promised to fix in the Everglades, including buying huge sections of farmland between Okeechobee and the Tamiami Trail, that is going to eliminate some of the pesticides and especially herbicides, which have done something weird that uh, I learned about 15 or 20 years ago. They have a big invasive plant problem. Obviously, there's some that you already know about, but the biggest invasive problem they have is cattails. They're out competing the sawgrass because of the nutrients that are getting into the water from the farms. And cattail marshes are now covering probably 40% of the sawgrass, especially north of the Tamiami Trail. And I would never have thought of cattail as being a bad plant, yet down there it is, and it's clearly because of the nutrients. This last year when we saw that this is probably people ask me what's my favorite bird it's got to be swallowtail kite, how could you not want to just hug one. Finally, after the big giant stuff you look for the little things green tree frogs sitting on a mangrove uh, seedling and then weirdly what are you talking about having a freaking. Uh, cactus in Everglades in South Florida with all this water around, even the dry season, it ain't that dry. Well, it's dry enough for cactus. And these uh, cactuses are uh, uh, basically the same species as the ones out west. Uh, some of them uh, are, they're all natural and uh, they are quite, quite abundant. But in that same area, you can get all these uh, laughing gulls sitting there when it's, when it's a rainy season. So it's, the variation is spectacular. These little islands in some of the middle of the Everglades host a lot of birds during the non-nesting season for nighttime roosts. And so we could, you can sit there and watch 10 species of herons and egrets, spoonbills, maybe 15 of them just flying into these things overnight. And they're just beautiful places to sit and listen. This is up at the uh, Anhinga Trail, uh, one moonlit night where we wanted to go and just listen for the frogs and, uh, and other things that are up there. And uh, these are some of the stars from the southern sky. And then one year, I cannot believe this, we got up and we're driving just out of Flamingo to just go for a night cruise. And we look up and this is what the sky looked like. This is the real color. This isn't a faked picture. It was red. And there's the Big Dipper in there in the middle of it. So we're looking north. And uh, I asked the naturalist what was going on. And I said, we saw it too. We have no clue. They got the newspaper the next day. And there were people saying, oh, it must have been, I can't remember that uh, Miami Vice show. They must have had some big explosion out there for a filming and it turned the sky red. Eight days later, it was discovered it was the Northern Lights that got all the way down to South Florida. It happens about once every hundred years <laughs> from what I understand. And, and of course the red uh, wavelength travels the furthest and that's what we saw. And we had, nobody had any clue what the heck we were watching. So it was kind of an exciting little night. And that first trip, 
I can't believe it. Three days we were there only. Three days and three nights, and we're coming back late at dusk, and there's a bobcat walking along the edge of the road. I said, you've got to be joking. And then it crouched down, and I said, oh my God, and I've got a little Pentax 35 millimeter camera with film, some of you may recall film, trying to get pictures at dusk with a shutter speed of about 1 80th of a day and taking pictures left and right. And this thing crouched down and we look up and there's a marsh rabbit 20 feet away. And in six seconds, this bobcat makes a leap and grabs the rabbit. And we thought, oh, and then it walked right past our car with it. <laughs> now, I know this is predation, but so what? It's predation. It's what happens. And now that marsh rabbit and the bobcats seem to be nearly gone. And that's because of what? The pythons. There are something, the est rough estimate is something or between uh, 100,000 and 300,000 pythons that were dumped by people uh, from pets, but also the last hurricanes got into homestead in parts of Miami and leveled buildings, including zoos and pet stores. And there were baboons running loose in homestead. There were strange animals from around the world that were running loose. Most of them, I think, were caught, but the pythons didn't. And there is ongoing efforts to do what they can because most people have been reporting a dramatic loss of small mammals, and small mammals is from deer down. And that uh, seems to be the case. The last few trips I've taken, remarkably few of these. Now, it doesn't mean they're all gone. In fact, some people are saying the snakes aren't having that big of an effect on these, but the, these animals are, are hiding better or not being as visible. But there are people now trying to do everything. The state has a hunting uh, season. And actually, they have a... a, 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 a if you, if you kill a snake, they will pay you. Uh, they've got a bounty on these snakes, 20 or 25 bucks per foot or something like that. And uh, yet all the people are going out there, they'll get a few, but they don't even come close to the number of pythons that are out there. And so some of the biologists are now talking about dropping um, either poisoned um, dead bunny rabbits and rats so that the pythons would eat and then die but nobody's really sure if that's a good idea either because they're not the only snakes out there either. So it's a really complex problem that needs some really modern thinking for sure. It's complex like these webs. Oh, I didn't even mean to do that. And in the morning, the dew, it's not just one spider. If you're afraid of spiders, don't go here. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of these beautiful uh, spider webs that are out in the in the sawgrass prairies, and you just cannot stop seeing um, everything out there that is really incredible. It's not just the big things; it's a lot of these little ones. Anybody know what the butterfly is on the bottom left? Somebody must. It's in a, it's called the Atala. It's an endangered species found only in a few places now. It used to be pretty unique there. Uh, it, it, it's the caterpillars feed only on cycads, and cycads have been wiped out for most of it, although they're now becoming a house, a, a garden plant. And so in some places, the Atala butterfly is getting to be a little bit more common, uh, which is kind of neat. Lots of tropical spiders down there, uh, and uh, the white peacock butterflies, it's as common as, as monarchs are up here. There are monarchs down there, but there's also queen monarchs of different species. And in fact, when uh, people, um, Lincoln Brower at Amherst College and the uh, other people who were trying to find where all those monarchs were going, they thought maybe Florida because Florida has overwintering monarch butterflies. They breed year round, uh, but nope, they kept on going, as you all know. It's another story altogether. These tropical hardwood hammocks, beautiful um, areas to get to if there's a boardwalk. They are impenetrable hell places. <laughs> it's really tough. Strangler fig on the right, hugging a mahogany tree. And these are native uh, tropical uh, plants that are all getting along one way or another. As you know, uh, spectacular view of these. Uh, 
the uh, ferns that uh, dry up in the dry season and a little bit of rain and they <laughs> spring to life within an hour of each other. And they are incredible variations in life. If you look carefully, you might get a whippoorwill uh, sitting on a branch. It only happened two or three times down there. They look so much like a branch, it's just embarrassing though. And then of course the owls are superbly common down there. Uh, barred owls are abundant as they are here. I heard a couple the other night down in the Berkshires and who, somebody had a screech owl here the uh, day or two ago. So these are spectacular birds with incredible geographic ranges, different foods. The um, barred owls down there are feeding an awful lot on small mammals, but is also on crabs and other things that are in these wetlands. Tremendous variation in these, and I think we're just about at the end of it. So the Anhinga Trail here, where you can see, photograph, paint, just take in this marvelous stuff. It is the first place that people visit when they come to the Everglades, and there was a sort of a sad story one of the naturalists told me. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there's an alligator that comes out of the slough, Taylor Slough, and lies on the walkway six foot alligator, eight foot alligator, just this is my spot. So I'm sitting here. People sometimes try to walk around. I've actually seen people. This is just one example. So don't get this wrong. This guy told his wife to go sit next to the alligator. So we get a photograph. <laughs> she had other words for him. <laughs> and she made him do it. He went and sat in front of an alligator resting and took a picture and got away with it. And I've seen this several times. Alligators are the nicest animals on earth. They're too polite. And yet people do that. And one of the naturalists, last, one of the last times I was there said, yeah, a few weeks ago, um, a person came in walking her dog on a leash. They're not allowed, of course, here. Um, and he stopped her and explained the rules and why it's a bad thing. And she was very, upset over it and very huffy a little princess doesn't sit in the car but he convinced her and she left he didn't notice when she came back with the dog in her arm and then walked it on this boardwalk that you're seeing here and the it was on a leash and the dog went down to the water for a drink and an alligator grabbed it she started screaming of course and lots of people did and the naturalist heard it and came running out and he saw what was happening by the time he got there the, the leash was on, on around her wrist and she was getting pulled down. And uh, he had all he could do was to get that off her wrist. And she then yelled that he had to go and save the dog. <laughs> and it's, it's a tough problem uh, for sure. Uh, he did not save the dog. There was no saving, it was already, in fact, if you already know what alligators can do, the, the first thing is a big crunch. And that's what they um, basically, stop their prey from moving after that. So there's no hope for this dog. And she screamed and yelled that she was gonna arrest him and take him to court. And 15 people said, he said to me, 15 people came up and handed them either their business card or wrote their name and phone number down and said, if you go to court, call us, we will help you. So these parks are not playgrounds. They're not zoos. These are real wild landscapes that we need to keep in mind. They are their parks for the wildlife. They're not there for people. Although you can go there as so many people do and enjoy them for sure. You can watch an incredibly amazing bird with incredible adaptations do its stuff. It'll show you the fish it's eating. And then here's the cormorants now who have the most beautiful turquoise eyes. Uh, that you can ever imagine. And they are really spectacular. None more so than this. And of course, seeing one of these things was, uh, we didn't see it for two or three years, but getting a purple gallinule to stop, uh, stop for a moment for us to see was truly incredible. But I was also impressed with uh, all the night herons, uh, the uh, anis, uh, the Cuban tree frogs, and then this. I came up to the Anhinga Trail one day and there were two guys who were sneaking up around the building and they said, uh, I see one and their, their accents for, were European, I think they were German. 
and they, they were saying to each other, I think I see it, I think I see it. And the other one says, where is it, where is it? And I'm thinking, oh God, they must have a purple gallon wolf. And I walked up and they were looking at a cardinal, the first one they'd ever seen in their life. And I remind people that I don't care how common something is in your backyard, it's not found everywhere else in the world. It is unique here and we need to embrace every single one of them. And as weird as it is, I had to go 1400 miles to learn that, <laughs> to learn that lesson. It really is important. And the other important thing is you can't see everything all the time. These are raccoon tracks and a bobcat tracks out at Cape Sable where we paddled out and, and spent a couple of nights here on the edge of Florida Bay in the national park in the wilderness where nobody else was around. And as I was telling them at uh, dinner earlier, uh, in the morning when we woke up, we could hear pew, pew, dolphins just offshore that were swimming along here. I, you see all this stuff anywhere in the world. I've seen them in the Galapagos Islands. I've seen all these things elsewhere. But I have to say, like most of you, when you get to see your first incredible things, like an American alligator, perhaps one of the most endangered species that are down there, these crocodiles are really incredibly beautiful. And every species, no matter what they are or what you think they are, deserves some attention. But you can't save them without saving the landscapes that are around them. And so buy that house <laughs> over there and take a look at some of the things that you will save. And yes, one year we had real flamingos uh, in um, Florida Bay, in the town, off the town of Flamingo. And they were almost certainly the expanding ones from the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, the rest of the stuff, if you, everybody probably has one of those giant conch shells in your house. This is what the animals look like. One year, the, uh, the uh, um, naturalist said, uh, we've got this handmade canoe with a sail on it. You want to come out and we're going we're gonna to spend the night, I'm going to spend the night on this little shell island that we went out to. It's the same island that John James Audubon spent his time and named the um, great white heron, which has now changed, but still the great white heron. And it was incredible. We woke up to that view you just saw of no water. It had, it had dramatically low tide. And yet these conks were walking around in that muck. And I had never seen one so alive and so spectacular. And of course the, the skimmers were doing the same thing. So I'm gonna end here now and thank you all for spending a few minutes with me telling stories of when I was young and when I'm still old, I still go down there. And I hope you all have a similar kind of a place. And even if it's just your backyard, it's just as important. Thank you all. Um. Thank you so much, Tom, for that. Such a feeling of uh, journeying with you there, all those different trips you made. Um, you, you have time for some questions? Only 100. <laughs> <laughs> or three. Did you um, want to speak a little bit about the, the efforts underway to restore the water flow? Yeah. It's still a big issue uh, because the plans started 15 years ago and they've only done a small percentage of what they were supposed to do. Um, Congress makes the money, uh, uh, spends the money, and they have been in recent years, some of you know, not very supportive of any kind of ecological stuff. The whole idea that uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was fighting was the plan to drain the swamp. That was the plan, and that's been the plan ever since, and it's still around. Let's just get rid of this stupid water and build more houses. And this was and has been a guy named Flagler uh, put a railroad through there. Uh, the original road is still there, hidden uh, off of the main road that you can walk on, spectacular. Uh, the efforts, but again, it's the Everglades Park is just that small little section of this massive landscape. And so the federal government's plans, besides just getting more water out there, is to reduce herbicides, pesticides, and buy more properties that have been really all agriculture. And there's a real big fight, especially with the current governor, 
uh, down there about not funding more of this restoration. So it's a tough problem that, the, that these um, folks have. And the head of the Park Service, National Park Service, is, is given the job by the president. They're not, they're not elected, <laughs> they're appointed. You are now the head of the Park Service. And some of the last Park Service in the last 20 years or 30 years, Park Service heads have been anti-conservation completely and happy about that. And so it is, however, happening. As I said, the Tamiami Trail, those, the uh, uh, overpass and more holes in it are really spectacular. So uh, it's probably never gonna be finished, but it's a start. That's all I can say about that. Hi, I'm just wondering how much the um, change in water temperature is affecting the Everglades. Yeah, the biggest issue is climate change. And the, you know, when you're three feet above sea level and that's it, uh, the story is not very hopeful uh, because as sea level rises, now it doesn't rise everywhere at the same time nor equally, but um, South Florida has been underwater all the time. All that marl is all basically seashells that have um, solidified into stone. And so South Florida has been up and down underwater uh, since the Pleistocene, before that, uh, up and down. And uh, it's, but it's been stable for eight or 9,000 years. And um, the, the fear is, is that it's not gonna, be, uh, not gonna be good shape. But what was your particular question about? About the water temperature, yeah, how the it's temperature. affecting things. So at the moment, it doesn't seem to be an issue. Although um, there is a miniature seahorse that lives in Florida Bay. I mean, it's, it's only three inches tall. And that seems to be an animal that is more affected potentially for temperature change in the bay. And as that muck in the bay that gets flushed down um, gets thicker, it does, it does raise the temperature a little bit, but I don't have any current data on what that's likely to be, but I think that's something that they're looking at. I know it is. Um, I don't know what the temperature change is gonna be, but it's, it's poopy, no doubt about it. So most of us people from Massachusetts go down to Florida in the winter is there a time of year that if someone was going to go down there or the different time of year that you would suggest and what would be interesting? No. <laughs> gotcha. If you go in the summer, two things happen. A billion mosquitoes and virtually no birds. They have dispersed. They're not breeding, so they're not congregating in the, in the and there's no pools to congregate in. Uh, when the alligators, you know, dig their gator holes, they actually make elevation two to three feet. And that's where the, the hardwood hammocks will grow uh, if there's not natural stuff. So uh, I did it one time because we were idiot kids. And oh, let's just try it in the summer. Never got back again. It was really brutal. I can't say that it wasn't awful because we would drive the road at night and there'd be incredible numbers of frogs. But to get out of the car and see one, you get lifted out by the mosquitoes. And it was a little brutal, I have to say, and I'm too embarrassed to even admit that, but don't go at a different time. You can go as early as, as uh, now and as late as um, maybe the 1st of April. But after that, hmm. Thank you. Hmm, yeah, stay, uh, stay in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's still still too hot in Orlando. You're right, exactly. Any other questions? Oh, here. Thanks. How much uh, sea level rise there is is that area expecting in the next, say, twenty years? They are expecting um, one to two feet of sea level rise, and that uh, was the last estimate I heard a couple of weeks ago and uh, that will completely change the Everglades uh, because the only, only the part of it that's still in the park 
the rest of it is likely to be gone anyway, but um, it, 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 there's some really fear. So all those people talking now about um, international debate on climate change uh, in Dubai, let's hope they really mean it this time, at least parts of it and see what happens. We'll see, um, hopefully. Um, we, you know, we can't all drive um, in, uh, electric cars, but we can drive slower on 128. <laughs> <laughs> What's the real speed limit out there? Is it like 80? Whatever you can get away with. with. <laughs> <laughs> I was very impressed. I was, I, I'm one of the idiots that actually drives the speed limit. And like, by far, bicycles pass me. It's just, <laughs> at any rate, sorry. I didn't mean to get off that. Robert. Yeah, could you talk about the big cypress swamp, which I guess is not part of the national park, but is still a preserve No, it's, there. it is a separate national entity uh, that is to the west of much of it. If you go to the Tamiami Trail, uh, heading west from the entrances to the park, then you hit the big giant cypress. And that giant cypress preserve is, uh, I've only been into three or four times because I've spent all my time looking at other stuff down in the park, is breathtakingly beautiful. And I mean, the the amount of, uh, of uh, wildlife in there and just the stands of these magnificent trees. And it's the last, one of the last hopes for mountain lions, for the Florida panther, uh, of which there is now an estimated 200. And that is way up from my days, the earliest days we went down there, there was less than 20. That was the estimate of the population. And now they're up to about 200. However, more of them are now being hit by cars and young ones have been known to be fed upon by pythons. So it's a, it's a funny issue. It's complicated and it gets more complicated. Don't bring more stuff down there. If you go down to Florida in the winter, come back with everything you brought. That would be my guess. Unless you had something else about that you wanted to, you wanted to say, Rob. Yeah, big cypress. Have you spent time there? I did a walk looking for orchids in the big cypress swamp, yeah. and I know like I got off of this old railroad trail or something, and I had to take a compass with me because as soon as I stepped off of the path, there's absolutely no landmarks. Yeah, so you know we use GPS incredible. now. <laughs> <laughs> but your mention of the orchids, I didn't don't know why I didn't put a picture. Of it. What's the most spectacular small animal that lives in the cypress trees and all the others as well? And I mean the small little animal. People used to collect these and burn down a hammock so nobody would get that unique color morph of the tree snails. These tree snails, terrestrial snails that in the dry season ooze out some gunk around their body and glue their shell to, the, to, a, to a branch or to a tree trunk. And they spend all dry season on these trees. And then when the wet season comes, that dissolves and they start cruising around. There are hundreds of color morphs of these things. And people used to make big collections. In fact, the park service in the earliest days had all these beautiful glass cases with 10 to 20 color morphs in each of these cases in their little auditorium where they had a film and uh, they don't show that anymore. Uh, and it's really amazing. And people literally, it's like collecting anything. It's rare, so you do it. And like orchids also have been poached heavily down there. Uh, they used to actually, in the earliest days, they would stop your car on the way out and, and check your car to see if you've stolen anything. And uh, they haven't done that in decades. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. And it is easy to see some of these beautiful orchids down there. Now, if you go in the summertime, you can see orchids in bloom. You'll die, but you'll see orchids in bloom. <laughs> Leela, were there any questions from online? None of our virtual folks? Okay. Anything else from the group here? Oh, Leela, on your side. Um, why are the cattail populations growing in Florida? Are they usually, are they already native to there and are they growing? They are native as a rare plant. Um, 
and they can't compete with the sawgrass um, because they need a lot of nutrients. And so the sawgrass is what's dominated all of South Florida forever. Uh, now with excess nutrients runoff from the farms, those nutrients are now providing tons of food that the cattails are taking advantage of. And so if you go on Tamiami Trail and you see an airboat ride, it's all cattails uh, that are there and virtually none of the sawgrass or even any of the, the beautiful uh, water lilies that, uh, that are typically there. So the cattails are an example of, are, are, are there because of the excess nutrients that are running off from just south of Okeechobee. It's that one river where you remember those arrows that flowed down towards the Gulf of Mexico, down towards Florida Bay, and then off to the Atlantic. And all of that is bringing incredible amounts of nutrients that were never there before. So lots of species disappear when the cattails take over. It's, it's a monoculture. And even though it's a native species in Florida, especially at further north, it's not ever been this abundant. I've got one online actually that oh, just good. came through from Debbie. Um, do they have organized tours and campgrounds? Oh gosh, yes. The Park Service people do, they have naturalists, they're the seasonal naturalists. They have to work in the Everglades in the winter and then they go to someplace like Yellowstone in the summer. <sighs> Must be heck. And they're fantastic. And so they have constant programming. Uh, they get talks at night, they lead walks, canoe trips, whatever you want. And then there's lots of other groups outside, uh, private groups that lead tours down there. So there's lots of birding groups that go in there all the time because you can see some real specialties if you, if you uh, are after that. And, uh, but they, the birding groups typically don't just stay in the Everglades, they'll go down to the Key West and all the other spots out there for other things. So there's plenty of good educational programs to get involved with. If you go to Shark Valley, that other one road that used to be an oil um, refinery, uh, oil uh, platform, uh, you take a tram around a two mile route and you just sit there and listen to the stories and then you can walk the whole thing for the rest of the day. All right, I'm going, I'm going back now. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. That was great. That was terrific. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, don't forget the donation box. If you'd like to contribute something extra, it is always welcome. Uh, and I hope we will see you back here on uh, for the members meeting on uh, January 5th. Friday, January 5th is our annual members meeting. So thanks for coming.